Good afternoon, distinguished guests and fellow students. In both academic and political discussions, Karabakh's issue is more associated with Kosovo, Abkhazia, Transnistria, when things come to making comparisons. This seminar is about self-determination cases of Palestine and Nagorno-Karabakh. The aim of this seminar is to provide new approaches to the matter of discussion. By linking Karabakh self-determination issue with other similar cases, it becomes more accessible to foreign public. It is with great pleasure for both me and UCL students to have one of the most prominent academicians and professionals in the field. Our guest speaker got his PhD in comparative politics from University of Cincinnati, Ohio. Professor Manuel Hassassian served Bethlehem University and the Palestinian people with distinction for 25 years. He has made significant scholarly contributions in the field of political science with the publication of over 100 reviews, articles, and chapters, including Palestinian political culture, civil society, and the concept of citizenship. The transformation of Palestinian civil society and its role in developing democratic trends in the West Bank and Gaza Strip, and historical justice and compensation for Palestinian refugees, Armenian struggle for self-determination, the Armenian question historical series, the historical evolution of the Armenian question and the conflict over Nagorno-Karabakh. <coughs> Among his academic awards and honors, Professor Hassassian was awarded an honorary doctorate by the University of Reims, France, and nominated by the Center of International Development and Conflict Management, University of Maryland, for the Gleitzman Middle East Award. And this is only a tiny piece of his academic and professional career. Without further ado, I hereby have the honor to introduce you His Excellency, Professor Hassassian, the Special Envoy of Palestine to the United Kingdom. Thank you, Ashot. I would like to thank the Armenian Society uh, at UCL. And I'm so privileged. This is not the first time I come to UCL. I've been here several times, but on a different mission. The mission of only talking about Palestine. Today I'm trying to make an approach of a comparative type of uh, an approach on the Palestinian, and yet the issue of Nagorno-Karabakh, which has been dormant for so many years, and then came into existence again, you know, with the earthquake in Armenia and with the secession of the Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh. It is with great pleasure that I come to you here with an open mind of being an objective scholar rather than a propagandist for Armenia or for Palestine. So I'm not going to wear the hat of a diplomat as much as I will be an academic scholar talking about two conflicts that have a lot of parallelism that we can draw and, and, and try more or less to spot 
on the main uh, denominators of uh, such conflicts. Such conflicts are considered to be protracted conflicts because it goes beyond the element of territoriality where the dimension of religion becomes, you know, a much uh, a clearer uh, uh, factor, you know, in more or less bolstering certain attitudes uh, on both sides. Of course, it is, it, is, it is unfair in 30 minutes to talk about a conflict that has been going on on the Palestinian side more than 100 years and over Nagorno-Karabakh. It's, it's a conflict that started in 1917. So it's, both conflicts are old conflicts, and yet they have not been resolved, I mean, uh, fully for the simple fact that there are certain kind of de, jure, de facto recognition on both sides, but still the de jure recognition is not by the international community being made. And that's why these conflicts are considered to be protracted and they have been going on for a long period of time. But it is nice, I mean, uh, as academic, as an academic and as an audience who, who basically are considered to be, you know, uh, students of politics and history, as I assume, is to talk about, you know, the theories of conflict management, because you cannot just take it from a historical perspective without finding certain plausible solution of how to resolve the conflict. And if you don't put a strategic vision, basically, of how to go about solving such, uh, uh, such conflicts, then, you know, I think it will be very, uh, very, very subjective approach, you know, to find plausible solutions to such conflicts. And because the question of emotions is, uh, is so high, I mean, value laden, it's, it's, it becomes even much more complex and complicated to talk about it, you know, uh, in, 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 in a way where uh, it should be much more focused on the inner dynamism of, of the factors that revolve around this conflict. I would like uh, to say that I have been uh, teaching conflict management for the last 17 years. And I have been as a diplomat, not as a diplomat, but as a specialist, diplomat seven years, but as a specialist in second track negotiations since the early 1990s, 91, 92, I became much more involved in uh, second track negotiations, what we call citizens diplomacy. And uh, being involved in at least 52 second track negotiations with the Israeli side, I think I have the experience to tell you exactly, a first-hand experience, how is it that it is so easier when you are in second track than first track negotiations. In second track negotiations, basically the participants have the sky as their limit and they can be innovative, they can think outside the box, they don't have any calculated risk, so anything that comes to their mind, they just put it. And because of that, you know, I wanted to discipline myself, you know, as a basic negotiator, you know, whether on Palestinian side, or even I was consulted on the Armenian side because I'm well versed with the Armenian issue. I have published so many books on the Armenian question. And being an Armenian by ethnic origin, you know, and a nationalist also, of course, you know, as an Armenian, I have vested interest, basically, in studying the, 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 the history of Armenia, yet alone, let alone I was among the first to publish, you know, a booklet in Arabic and in English on the issue of Nagorno-Karabakh. And people, you know, sometimes they talk about the essence of this conflict as being between Azerbaijan and, and, and Armenia. But the essence of this conflict started not with Azerbaijan, basically, and not with Lenin, even. It was in 1917, when the British wanted to get the Baku oil concession. There, they started, you know, the issue of Nagorno-Karabakh, where the British, you know, are involved. And when we talk about common denominator between Palestine and, and Nagorno-Karabakh, the British should, should, should shoulder their historic and moral responsibility towards these two issues. And this is where we can start, you know, talking historically about the involvement of the UK government, you know, Great Britain, in, on the issue of Nagorno-Karabakh during Lloyd George's, basically, era. And by the same token, you know, in Palestine, when in 1917, LMB crossed the, crossed the bridge and went into Palestine, West Bank, Transjordan, what have you, and they have mandated, you know, Palestine for almost 30 years. In order to understand, basically, the, 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 the dynamics of these conflicts, I think it is important that to share with you a theory that we have put together at the University of Maryland, where I have been teaching for the last 17 years. It's called Aria. Aria, it's the musical Aria, you know? 
Aria stands for A stands for adversarial, R stands for reflexive, I stands for integrative, and A, the last A of the Aria, stands for action plan. So this is a model that we use in conflict management, and I don't consider it conflict resolution, because, you know, there is no conflict resolution. Most of the conflicts in the world have not been resolved. So let's approach it from a technique that we call conflict management. And conflict management is trying, for more or less, to control and to, to try to find certain solutions to crisis situations and not uprooting you know, the whole problem and trying to find a concrete solution to it. So I, I consider this crisis management or conflict management and what have you. Now, if I just describe to you telegraphically what ARIA stands for, I think you can understand exactly when we use this technique with students, Israelis and Palestinians, Azeris and Armenians from Nagorno-Karabakh, and we did that at the University Your Excellency, we did that at the University of Maryland. We brought Azeri students and we brought Armenian students who came all the way from Nagorno-Karabakh, Artsakh, to discuss, you know, the issues. First of all, when, when we started, you know, with both teams, different teams at different times and what have you, the adversarial position, which is the first A in our conceptual model, is where the dialogue of the deaf takes place. In other words, we bring an issue and we say, we are at the United Nations, something happened. Of course, you have the delegate from uh, 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 the Armenian side and the delegate from the Azeri side, and they start putting their case in front of the United Nations. Each tries to prove that this land belongs to him historically, morally, I mean, juridically, whatever. And by trying to put his, his perspective in front, he doesn't listen to the other side. He doesn't even share, you know, what the other side is saying. So what happens eventually, each would like to score points. And by scoring points, they become deaf. They don't listen to each other. And that in itself reaches a point where there is no dialogue. And that dialogue is lost because each is trying, more or less, to, co to impress the other side that he is right and the other side is wrong. And here you can see the finger pointing, the body language and this. And the higher the voice they think, the higher their position, the better their position are in terms of impressing, you know, the international community. Okay, after we go through this process of intensive argument, where the end result is both sides run out of gas. They have no more arguments to impress each other. It's over. They're stuck. That's it. That's my position. And the other says, that's my position. OK, so where do we go from here? Then we tell them, why don't you try to think? This is the reflexive, which is the psychological uh, trauma, or what I call soul-searching process in which, you know, the delegates would have to go to justify and rationalize why they have taken such position. How can they defend now those extreme positions that they have taken in the first place? So it becomes very difficult to rationalize emotion, uh, involvement, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a conflict where, you know, it's a zero-sum conflict, your gains are my losses. Once they, we go through that process, which is the most difficult in this you know, conceptual model of conflict management, I think they realize that they have to be now rational and less emotional. And when they become more rational, less emotional, then this is a prelude towards an entree into what we call the age of pragmatism, where you have to choose between constraints. Pragmatism is choosing between constraints. You don't have the luxury of having your maximalist approach while you have to opt for something called optimum. And in order to reach your optimum, you have to start with maximalist position. And in the final, and to rationalize that, you have to be accepting that there would be compromises. And those compromises, and those compromises are considered to be concessions. Concessions for a win-win situation rather than for a win-lose situation. So from that perspective, this psychological of how to justify your position 
and it becomes much more difficult because there are there are no clear cut issues here. Okay, sometimes there are other factors that make it much more complex and difficult. Now, when I started dealing with the with the idea of Nagorno Karabakh, there was a Jewish professor who was much more sympathetic to the Azeris, and he's a colleague of mine who teaches with me the Palestinian Israeli conflict at the University of Maryland. You know. Uh, when he started giving certain kind of solutions, I figured, I said, listen, my friend Eddie, it's not enough to be a conflict management practitioner. You should also know the history. Without knowing the history, you cannot moderate, and you cannot try to pinpoint where these parties or the negotiators are deviating or distorting the facts just to score points. You should know exactly first the historic position of both sides in order to make sure that when you try to moderate between the two partners in conflict, you are not taking sides. <laughs> and this is where the trick with the Americans at third party, when I try to compare it basically with the Palestinian-Israeli negotiations. The third party has always unequivocally was supporting the other side, the, the top dog, the Israelis. They were never acting as a third party trying to mediate and, and reconcile the differences between you know, the Palestinians and the Israelis. And since the Palestinians are the underdog, they are the ones who have been conceding all the time. It's not the top dog that concedes, it's the underdog. To equate that balance, we need a third party. And if that third party is supporting and bolstering unequivocally the top dog, then we don't call these negotiations, we call these power politics dictat. And that's why I always say, we, the Palestinians, we never had negotiations with the Israelis. We go in there, we sit down, and they bring us you know, all their maps, the generals. Take it or leave it. So these are not considered to be negotiations. And we tell the Americans, where are you on this issue? I mean, when you come, and you try to persuade us to accept what the Israelis are offering us, I mean, the sense of third party is lost there. There is no third party. So when we finish this soul searching process, then we have to look at the glass as being half full. And that's the integrative approach. Let's say, how are we going to compromise our differences? Let's look at plausible solutions. And plausible solutions meaning that both have to concede and both have to make certain kind of concessions and compromises in order to reach their optimum in the final analysis. And this is where we shift from the integrative approach to something called search for common ground. And when we search for common ground, then we look at the glass as half full. We don't look at it as half empty. And searching for common grounds Meaning that you have to think outside the box. You have to think laterally, as Edward de Bono have taught us. Think laterally. Think that the sky is, is the limit for you. Think outside the box and try to come up with all kinds of, of innovative ideas. Ideas that you never thought that they would, you know, be carried out or being accepted. But bring them and put them in that box. And then we reach the final stage, which is the action plan. We prioritize, which comes first from all these perceptions, all these ideas that we put in the box, we agree which comes first, which is more important. So we factorize the most important elements and we go through an action plan process where both parties eventually would accept the minimum, the minimum, and yet, as far as they are concerned, this is the maximum that they could have achieved at the negotiating table. Now, ladies and gentlemen, these are not only theories that we have dealt with, you know, on a level with students, but we have dealt it with professionals, with professionals and with officials. Unfortunately, when it comes to the high echelon of decision making, we are stuck with these people. Because there is no political will to move on. And if one side is not ready to make peace or to compromise or to sit at a negotiating table, you know, table, Par, on par, you know, on parity, looking eye to eye in negotiation, it won't work. Then they resort to something called power, military power, or political power, 
or support from an international power and what have you. So there will be an imbalance there. Okay. Now, when we talk about the concept of self-determination, this is a concept that we, of course, students of history, bumped into it, you know, back in the early 1916, I mean, with the League of Nations, with Woodrow Wilson, the president who put the 16 points, and one of them was, was considered to be self-determination. And self-determination is a universal human right. Every country, every people has the right for self-determination. There is no selection there. You know, you have the right, I don't have the right. Everybody has the right. Okay? Now, when we talk about Nagorno-Karabakh, and we look at the situation before 1915 and afterwards, one constant element has been the majority, the absolute majority of the population are Armenians. Even when the Azeris, even when Lenin came, when he wanted to mix the nationalities and to try to integrate, you know, uh, all these hundreds of nationalities, different religions, you know, uh, the international proletarianism approach, I mean, to this, and the transfer of people from one state to another and whatever, he failed dismally because the question of religion and culture, regardless of the hegemony of the Soviet mentality of Marxism, of communism, and what have you, in the final analysis, it could not eradicate the sense of belonging and nationalism. Although, you know, for 70 years, the Armenians, uh, all other nationalities could not really express their, their opinion. And they have accepted, you know, as part and parcel of this transformation in their society, which is the communism idea. Fine. However, it did not really succeed in trying to create new facts on the ground. Now, we don't only have the problem of Nagorno-Karabakh, we have other problems too. With the Georgians, we have also problem with Now, we don't talk about all these problems at one, but these problems are there. We have a lot of territories that have been occupied, either by the Soviet Union, and let alone nine-tenths of our historic land is still under occupation. People forget that these lands are under occupation, under Turkish occupation. Now, we don't talk about it because, you know, oh, don't... Don't truck the boat now. You know, where well, you've been living in the diaspora. All we need is even the acknowledgement of the genocide has not been, you know, uh, accepted by the current governments in Turkey. They talk about human rights. They talk about this and they talk about that. And they try to solve problems and interfere in the Palestinian Israeli issue. And their supporters, one time of Hamas, one time of Hezbollah, now they are against Syria and this and that. They're trying to be a regional power while they have problems in their own backyard. They have the Kurdish problem and still they have the Armenian problem to resolve. So. It's not enough just to talk about Azerbaijan and Azeris and what the Azeris have in, in terms of, you know, uh, claiming, you know, Nagorno-Karabakh and what have you. You know, I have to be an ardent nationalist to tell you there is no excuse or no even legal, legal interest uh, or uh, what we call legal rights in Nagorno-Karabakh when it comes to Azerbaijan. How? We would like to know how they have legal... When, when the Jews come and tell me, oh, we own Jerusalem, I would challenge them. I tell them, what do you have in Jerusalem? You tell me. All the churches, all the mosques, all Christians and Muslims. This wall, the Wailing Wall, you think, and it is an alleged wall, that this is the remnants of the destruction of the Second Temple. And they have been excavating for the last 60 years now under the Dome of the Rock and the Haram Sharif to find the remnants of the destruction of the Second Temple. And they could not find anything, ladies and gentlemen. The Haram, the Askam, the Aksam, is going to be crumbled because of the diggings under, and nothing has been... So what do the Jews have in Jerusalem? When they say next year in Jerusalem, next year in Jerusalem, and Jerusalem is the eternal capital of Israel, what do you have in Jerusalem? Religiously, I'm talking. If you look at the travel guides where they put all the holy sites. Please look at any book that they have published, even from the Minister of Tourism in Israel. Show me where are the Jewish sites in Jerusalem. 
Yes, in history, might has been right. Might has been right. But this cannot continue to be the case. Because we have international awareness now. They do understand that there are people who have been, you know, being abused of practicing their own rights. So that's why when we talk about Nagorno-Karabakh, we see the Azeris are being also supported by the Turks because they speak Turkish, as you know. And they are supported by Turkey. And we, the Armenians, are supported by the Persians, by the Iranians. And that's why we have at least a certain kind of an access through land. Or because we don't have access through sea and what have you. It's under blockade and what have you. So for that simple reason, I think it is important when we talk about self-determination. Nobody was talking about ceding Nagorno-Karabakh to proper Armenia. We're not talking about that. This is the rights of the Armenians to decide. The people in Nagorno-Karabakh has the right to decide whether they want to be part of greater Armenia or not. And by the way, our Armenia is only one-tenth of historic Armenia. The Armenian Republic is only one-tenth. And when we talk about comparison, luckily that this one-tenth exactly has the same square miles area of Palestine, including Israel. We're talking about exactly 29,000 and some square kilometers. Exactly, geographically, the same size. And we used to say, who will dream that the Armenians one day will have their own independence? It was something under the Soviet Union, something, it's a lucky mirage. We never thought that we will have, you know, the, the Soviet Union will crumble and then we will have our independence. And we thought we, the Palestinians, we will have our independence long time ago. And this is the other way around. Today we have at least an independent Republic of Armenia, which is our motherland where we crave I mean, to look for and to, to support and to make sure that this republic will thrive economically and politically. And one day, who knows that we might go back and live in Armenia. But our rights cannot be compromised. And there was war in Nagorno-Karabakh. Blood was spilled over that part of the world. And if you go and read in history what happened in 1988, 89, in Shushi and what have you, massacres have been committed against the Armenians. But one thing I must say that the Armenians have learned from the Israelis, and this is the oxymoron of my position as a Palestinian, is the fact that, okay, we liberated Nagorno-Karabakh and we went 40 kilometers deep into Azeri land. And this is the strategy of thinkers, because in the final analysis, when you sit down and negotiate, you're not going to sit down and negotiate giving back Nagorno-Karabakh as much as you want to negotiate pulling out of Azeri territory. And that's fine. If that will be the compromise, that we're willing to withdraw and go back to our borders, which is Nagorno-Karabakh, and that's it. And let, I mean, the story goes on. It's over. But the people have the right to choose. And that's why self-determination is a very important concept. And I think the people in Nagorno-Karabakh have made up their mind and took arms struggle to fight for their own claim. Talking about now a little bit about the Palestinian issue, we have exactly the same protracted conflict. We're talking about two nationalism and three religions in, the, in, a, in a very small piece of land. How are you going to compromise two extreme nationalities with, with three monotheistic religions? That's the problem. And the Palestinian Israeli problem in Jerusalem, we know over what? Over one square kilometer. That's the bone of contention, the old city of Jerusalem. It's not the settlements outside, because the settlements has a special statutes where, you know, are considered under international law to be something illegal. And metropolitan Jerusalem is almost 10% of the West Bank being confiscated, adding it. You know, in order to solve the problem, you expand the pie, pie, the, the pie we say, expand the cake, and try to find solutions and cut it. When you expand it, it's easier. But the bone of contention is the one square kilometer, which is the old city, where the old city is divided into four, four quarters. 
And here comes the Armenian issue again. We control one-fourth of the old city, the Armenian quarter. And that Armenian quarter is strategically the most important because it is the border that separates East from West Jerusalem. And if we decided as Armenians to be part of West Jerusalem, then we can divide the Christian communities in Jerusalem into two, where it will be impossible for the churches to be connected again. And that's why in the year 2000, I had the privilege of being in charge of the Palestinian negotiating team on Jerusalem. And I was the one who negotiated the issue of Jerusalem. And I was the one who went to the patriarch, the late Torkom Manubian, and to ask him in front of my minister of Jerusalem, the PLO, the late Faisal Husseini, I said, your beatitude, tomorrow I'm going to meet Clinton. Arafat is already there, Barak, uh, or, uh, Ehud Barak is already there, the team has been there for the last 10, 10 days and they are waiting for the white smoke. Would you give me your position on the Armenian quarter, whether it is part of East Jerusalem or not? He said, my son, we are proud of you as an Armenian and we are proud as an Armenians to tell you that it is part and parcel of East Jerusalem. God bless you, go and fight for it. The next day, I was on my way to Tel Aviv airport to go to Washington, to, to Camp David, and I received a phone call that the entire negotiations have fumbled. <coughs> so don't even attempt. So I came back. The Armenian quarter, per se, also has been invaded by almost 99 houses being built by settlers inside the Armenian compound. And that makes it complicated when it comes to the final status. How are you going to compensate for these people? Are they going to be part of it or are they going to be dismantled? You know, we have a lot of headache because with previous patriarchs and, and bishops, you know, we had problems, you know, selling certain land to the Israelis. And they don't call it selling land as much as 99 years of lease, which is bull crap. It's like selling the land. And we have an issue there with almost 99 housing. And if you go to the, to the old city and to the Armenian quarter where my sister lives, I have a sister who lives there, their neighbor are Jew, just across next to each other. So it's gonna be a, a little bit tough to talk about that part of, of, of the conflict. Now, if you ask me today, where are we with the peace process? <clears throat> I tell you there is no peace, and there is no process, and there is no tunnel, and there is no light at the end of the tunnel. <clears throat> I can answer you very simply as I did in an interview with, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, uh, Sir David Frost. He told, he told me, where are you? In negotiation, I said, we are stuck between the historically inevitable and the politically impossible. <laughs> That's where we are. This government and the government to be in Israel is a government that is coming on a platform which is crystal clear, a platform of settlements, building bypass roads, continuing with the apartheid wall, separation, total separation, building the wall 10 kilometers deep into the West Bank, not on the armistice line of 1949. And this makes it more complicated. For the simple fact, there's no geographic contiguity left for a two-state solution. And why I say that? Because totally Gaza is under siege and separated from the West Bank. And the only nexus between the West Bank and Gaza has to be through land corridor by Israel, or a bridge by Israel. That's number one. Number two, East Jerusalem is totally being now isolated from the southern part of the West Bank. It's over with the, with the E1 plan, which is sealing the envelope, basically, of all these settlements. There is no access from the West Bank anymore to Jerusalem. You have to go through military checkpoints. And when we talk about the West Bank, the West Bank is being divided like the islands of Archipelago into three clusters of settlements in the north, in the middle, and in the south. So when Israel talks about the two-state solution, it is talking about Indian reservations. They're not talking about 
an independent Palestinian state or a political entity. Yet, the concept of two-state solution is a status quo plus. Consider con continuation with occupation plus. We give you like, you can administer your education, your health, you can collect your garbage, fine with us, and that's it. But there's no political entity. No border, no arms, nothing. And the other side, which is, you know, when you talk about the Jordan Valley, which is the West Bank and Jordan, the borders are totally considered to be military zone for Israel. And they're not even willing to talk about it because they say this is security. And for Israel, security is like 10 over zero undefined in mathematics. Everything is security. Everything you say is security. Every word you utter is security. But define to me security, he cannot define it. So I conclude it's 10 over zero undefined. So when they say, ah, even if we clinch a deal, <coughs> even if we clinch a deal, 40 years we will never discuss the borders of the Jordan Valley. This is for security reasons. After 40 years, we might negotiate, we see what we can do. So this is not a government or a state that is prepared to make concessions for coexistence. This is a country that wants to retain the occupied territories as part of their messianic vision of Eretz Israel. They are interested in the geography, but not in the demography. And that's why an ethnic cleansing process has been going on for the last several years now. And they're doing it discreetly, where they confiscate IDs. And, this, and I can give you a zillion stories, even the, the story of my late wife who could not go. And she was taking chemotherapy, and they forced her, and she got the virus, and she died. Because they forced her to go back. If, they don't, if you don't go back, then you lose your what they call travel document. Imagine, we have been born and raised there. We are considered returning residents, while the Jew in Poland, who has never seen Palestine, at the airport he gets a passport and becomes a citizen. Don't you think this is the apex of apartheid? It is apartheid. Today, people should not look at Israel as a democratic entity. And Israel cannot keep on fooling the world with its democracy while it practices democracy in one side of Jerusalem and an occupier on the other side. How can a democracy be an occupier? You, ladies and gentlemen, tell me. How can Israel still fool the world about the Holocaust while they are denying the Armenians even, just lately because of their own political expediency against Turkey? With the Marmara issue, they took a position and they started, you know, flirting with us on the issue that, yes, the Armenians were massacred in 1916. But before that, they always milked the Holocaust as if it is the only victims in the world. Now, we're not trying to sell ourselves Armenians as victims. We are selling ourselves as Armenians who are willing to fight for their own self-determination. We need the acknowledgment of what has been perpetrated against the Armenians back in 1915 and in 1921. And I believe the genocide continues as long as we are negated the right of going back to Turkey. It is so unfortunate that even many Armenians have been forced to become Muslims as crypto-Armenians. And there is, you know, a long, long, long story in history about, you know, all these events and what have you. We don't need to go into the details because this is not the time, neither the place to talk about the history, as much as we want to talk about the current politics of how to go about solving such complex and complicated issue. You know, war is the easiest way. If there is imbalance in power, war is the easiest way. And this uh, so far has been using, you know, military might in order to achieve its goals. <coughs> However, it will never achieve its goals in Palestine. I mean, look how many wars have been waged against the Palestinians in Gaza Strip in the West Bank. I was one of those who also have been struck by a big tow missile from a tank, you know, from across, you know, our house in Bejala. And my house was totally destroyed, you know, with a long tow missile. The debris is almost as, as much as this. But it, it, they did not convince us, and they did not scare us to leave, as they scared us in 1948 with the massacres. People. Now, do understand that they have no choices. They have to stay on their land 
and they have to fight. Either they fight through armed struggle or through non-violent means. And all options are open for people who believe that one day they will have their own right for self-determination. And this is what we are opting to. And this is why we went through the arduous peace process in order to tell the world that we are a peace-loving nation. All we need, your 70 resolutions that have always been pro-Palestine, to implement them. You only implement resolutions <coughs> that favor Israel. Ah, let's go and strike Iraq. Ah, let's go and strike Afghanistan. Ah, let's do something about Syria. Ah, Libya, intervention, Arab Spring, this, this and that. Commandos sent them here in 1956 to Lebanon. But when it comes basically to our rights, Palestinians, we don't see the position of the international community. So, crystal clear. And you know, during the 30 years of the British mandate, you can go to the archives, to the home office, to the public records. Every single document that came out of this country was pro-Arab and pro-Palestinian. However, when it comes to implementation, nothing. Look, started with the Padding Commission, Shaw Commission, Peel Commission, uh, the UNSCOPE, uh, the Anglo-American Committee of Inquiry. Oh, well, even even the, I mean, even the, the partition plan all tried to favor the Arabs and the Palestinians, but they did not implement, basically, all these resolutions. Why? Because there is the United States and the UK, and what I call, I mean, you know, the Troika in Europe, still supporting Israel. Still Israel is selling itself as the victims of the Arab war mongers, sell itself as the victim of anti-Semitism and what have you. I mean, to what extent students even at UCL will be convinced, you know, by these stories? Yes, okay. Nobody can deny what happened to the Jewish people. Everybody is sympathetic. We, I, as an Armenian and Palestinian, I'm more sympathetic than any other towards the Holocaust. What is wrong could not be rectified by another wrongdoing. And we cannot continue to be the victim's victim. We need to find solution for these conflicts. And it's unfortunate that there is no justice. Justice is not absolute. It's relative. We need justice. But who is going to give us justice? And because of that, I think it will be very, very, very difficult. When people are controlling, when they are in power, when they have all these vested powers to compromise. And I always say, I believe as a humble student of history, I say to myself, when do people make compromises? People make compromises when they are at the crescendo of their power. You don't make compromises when you are weak and subordinate. You make it when you are at the peak of your power. And I believe Israel today is at the peak of its power. Israel, this is the golden opportunity for them to make peace with the Palestinians because the Palestinians are going to be the only ones to give them their legitimate birth certificate in the Middle East. Without us, they will consider to be paria, and they will consider to be living in a garrison state with a siege mentality that psychologically is going to have greater impact, dramatic impact on these people. And who says that the United States of America is going to continue supporting Israel? One day Israel is going to become a strategic liability, sir. And once it is a strategic liability, great powers don't consider you know, small countries. In the game of nations, we know what power politics dictates. And who says that 1.5 billion Muslims, in, the, in 20, 20, 30 years, uh, there will be 2 billion Muslims, are going to accept the desecration of the holy sites by the, by the Jews? Do you think they're going to accept that? And who is saying that Arabs are going to continue to be atomized and factorized, while now we have the resurgence of Islamic fundamentalism, extremism coming to the Arab world? And who says that the Palestinians are going to continue to be divided between Hamas and Fatah and what have you? So the final result, I would say, and to clinch, is that Israel should understand that it cannot have the cake and eat it too. They have to understand to become part of the Middle East, they have to give the Palestinians the right to self-determination. Ladies and gentlemen, we made our historic compromise in 1988 when we have accepted 
a country on one fifth of historic Palestine, which is 22%, the West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem. And I believe the same issue goes as far as Nagorno-Karabakh. I think this is our country, our enclave. We have the right to say, but we don't say, we don't tell the Azeris, you, you cannot live there. You can live there. We are accepting them, you know, as neighbors and part, as citizens of Nagorno-Karabakh, but they don't have the right to control it politically and the way they did during the Soviet regime and what have you. Thank you very much. We are pushing you for the Q&A, <laughs> so that's why I have to stop. Thank you for the intriguing speech, Your Excellency. And so now we'll take maybe a five-minute inter intermission, and if anyone would like any water or wine, you're welcome. We'll I, I see the German here. Yes, of course. <laughs> uh, Sarkis, how many people are following us on your stream? Uh, overall, 60. 60. So we already have a question from them. This is the best easy water I've ever had in my life. Oh, yes. I, when I go to Beirut, Germany. But they sell it there? Yeah, oh, abundantly. Even in the. I get it in the US when I go to the US.
How can the crimes of humanity? Crimes against humanity. humanity. The, yeah. the whole issue, because that's part of the uh, human rights issue as well. And if that come, is brought to justice, how can that help the negotiating process? It is very hard, basically, to say I am the victim huh? and he is the perpetrator. Because now, if I bring an Israeli next to me, and we debate, he will be competing with me about victimhood, about being, you know, uh, attacked by terrorists, suicide bombings, launching rockets from Gaza. How, where do we draw the lines here? Do we talk about the causal effects, or do we talk about the repercussions? What prompted, basically, this kind of a conflict where it becomes a lethal conflict, where people are killing each other, all right? Now, it does not really help negotiators to sit down and start scoring points about who is more <coughs> vulnerable to become victim or not. That does not help. And if I say, you know, 20,000 people, 30,000 people have been killed. He would say, oh, 15,000 have been killed on my side. Then when we start, you know, debating numbers and, and who is suffering more and finger pointing, that's not a starter. So there would not be negotiations. We stick to our polarized position and we don't sit at the negotiating table to start with. Yeah. So I cannot, I cannot accept as a negotiator. Also, when we go in history, <coughs> And we say, oh, God, God gave us Islam 2,000 years ago. Is God a real estate agent? To tell you, you take this, Armenians take this, and others take that? I mean, come on. You cannot put your arguments on something that is baseless. We are the promised people. We are the chosen people, the promised land. These arguments were really more in the beginning when the uh, Jewish Aliyah started coming to Palestine, trying, you know, to evade from the massacres, pogroms in Russia, and later in, during Nazi regime, Hitler and what have you, those were said. But today, if you want my opinion, when I sit with secular, I mean, negotiators on the Israeli side, they don't use history anymore. They don't say that this is mine, this is not yours. But when you sit with the settlers in the West Bank, immediately, immediately, demagogically, ideologically, they tell this is our land. You, the Palestinians, are the trespassers, and we have the right to fight you and kick you out. All right? So it does not help. My answer to you, it does not really help. Regardless of the imbalance in terms of sufferings between the top dog and the underdog, but this is a non-starter in negotiations. Yes, but that was the case with Israel. That's how, I mean, the world accepted an atrocity took place and then awarded Israel to, to the Israel, the, the Jews, in mm -hmm. a way. Mm -hmm. And uh, if we look at Armenian genocide, why is the Turkish, the Turks so you know, against recognizing because they know something is going to come out of it. 
-hmm. in terms of you know ju justice and in terms of land and whatever. So I'm I'm trying to look at it and not because the way you put it was it's really you have two poles and they're not gonna understand each other no matter what and there's no justice but. If you look at the laws on justice, there is crimes against humanity, and if you prove that, then there are certain amount of um, awards that can be given to people who have suffered. So yeah, but those, what, yeah. yes. Mm. Now, your question is becoming geared into a different story. Mm. You said in negotiations. Yes. There won't be negotiations if we go back to this theory of who is suffering more. But if you tell me that the international law will be on the Palestinian side, on the Armenian side, because they have suffered genocide and continuation of ethnic cleansing, yes, I agree with you. Then the international committee has to put pressures on Israel. And the way to put pressures on Israel is to start the campaign of what we call boycott, divestment, and sanctions, which is BDS and try to treat Israel as an apartheid state. Then the international community will put pressure on the Israelis and will put also the international community at the stage where they have to bring these war criminals who have been you know, using all kinds of weapons against innocent civilians, whether in the West Bank or in Gaza. And do you know why the Americans and the UK, UK abstained? And the Americans, of course, voted yeah, against the you know, Palestinians going to the United Nations to become non-member states, even non-member states, which means observer status. Mm -hmm. we, we did not join the nuclear fan club where they should have taken such a position. You know why? Because now we have the right, we have the right to bring Israeli war criminals into justice. Mm -hmm. That's why they were afraid. They don't want us to be part of the ICJ the International Court of Justice, neither the ICC. But now we have the right. I don't have to go through Armenia if I have good... Re By the way, Armenians and Palestinians have excellent relations. Mm -hmm. and, and this relationship goes back to our status in Jerusalem, let alone also our road in the Arab world has been always pro. Mm -hmm. you know. So, okay. From that perspective, you know, I don't need to go to, through my Armenian colleagues to ask them on their behalf to pursue the war criminals of Israel. Now I can go straight to the ICJ and put you know, a request. And the UK cannot receive any of those war criminals, starting with Sipi Libni, with Ehud Olmert, with Ehud Barak, with Netanyahu, with Sharon. With... That's it, they cannot come here. Because also, you have to respect your laws at the UK border and agency. Once you have an application that these are war criminals, they have to go through the due process. All right. That's a different story. Yeah. Now, in order to raise the awareness yeah. of this, we need a good propaganda. Mm -hmm. We need now to use different techniques and different tactics. I personally wouldn't accept the technique of trying more or less using violence and suicide bombing. Mm -hmm. This is an obsolete technique, and it should not be used because that will automatically shun and alienate the international community from it. I believe in peaceful resistance. I don't even use the word non-violent because it has still negative connotation. I say peaceful resistance. We go and we stop in front of the military tanks and we prohibit them from confiscating land. And just last week, the celebration of the 10th anniversary of Rachel Khoury, who died you know, in Rafah, the refugee camp, when the bulldozers had killed her, she stopped in front of a house that was going to be, you know, bulldozed. Mm -hmm. All right? So this is the time where the international community should start step by step to put pressure on Israel. Academic boycotts. Boycotts that comes to, for example, the UK. The UK has military trade with Israel more than $4 billion. And you talk about democracy and justice? How? How do you support the, the, the military machine of Israel mm -hmm. while you're talking to me about justice for the Palestinians? Mm -hmm. And those kinds of weapons huh, are being used against you know, innocent civilians. What do we have? Do we have Apaches? Do we have Cobras? Do we have uh, an army to fight Israel? What do we have? Mm -hmm. 
We have stupid rockets that I call them firecrackers. You tell me how many Israelis have been killed from the thousands of rockets. Do we talk about the concept or do we talk about the consequences? What was the death toll? For the last eight years, 12 Israelis have been killed by these rockets, three of them heart attacks because of the sun. And you tell me this has shaken the security of the state of Israel? while well, thousands have been killed by the Palestinians. Okay. Professor, we have a question from uh, our audience via the live stream. Uh, so, Alec Pedrosian from Armenia, Yerevan, asks, um, there are powers represented in the Republic of Armenian Parliament who support the idea of Nagorno-Karabakh recognition. So, I would like to hear your opinion concerning the issue whether this will lead to the eruption of a new war, taking into consideration the aggressive policy of Baku. Well, actually, I, I tell you what. <coughs> I would like to sound a little bit optimistic. The price of war, where Armenians and Azeris have paid dearly, and you remember that period of time, I don't think it is advisable to recur that problem. Now, there are big power interests in that part of the world that would like to resolve this conflict peacefully, and peacefully meaning through negotiations. I don't believe that war is going to solve this problem, and I don't believe that neither Armenians nor Azeris are willing to be engaged in a bloody war. And I think certain compromises might take place if the great powers believe that if they need security in that part of and, 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 and security meaning stability, they have to resolve it. And the only way to resolve is through negotiations. Now, I cannot visualize what the end result would be but I believe that it, this is going to take a long period of time of dialogue and negotiations. I don't believe that it's going to be resolved by arms. If it is going to be resolved by arms, then there is no conflict resolution there. The Armenians will come back, the Azeris will come back, and the cycle of convulsive violence will continue. It cannot really be determined. And I think the United States should play a more significant role. And you know, Armenia is a strategic place for the interests of the U.S. and the Caucasus. I don't want to go into the details of that politics. So there is a high stake there. And at the same time, Azeris are lucky enough to have oil, that they are using it as a bargaining chip in order to get more powers you know, to side with them. But in the final analysis, I think they cannot continue to fight a losing war. There should be a compromise. And that we need a magic wand to solve. Yes, uh, Dr. Duncan. Oh, thank you, Professor Hassan. Thank you very much for your talk. Very interesting. Um, I had the chance uh, last summer to go to Bethlehem in Jerusalem, and I saw the wall. And I'm afraid what it reminded me of was the Berlin Wall I'd seen 30 years later, 30 years ago. It's even higher. It's, it's, it is actually. It depends where you are. It's, it is high. Yes, the center part is You're right. Yes. What I wanted to ask you about, um, the, towards the end of your talk, you expressed sympathy for the victims of the Holocaust. Yes. But earlier on in the talk, you, you used the phrase, I'll try and get it right, uh, the Israelis are fooling the world about the Holocaust. Not fooling the world, trying to use the world. Ah, I'm sorry, I thought I heard the word no, no, fooling no, no, no. the there world. There is a difference sorry. between distorting yeah. history mm. and trying to extract concessions mm. by selling themselves to be the only victims. Mm. All right? Yeah. But nobody is denying the Holocaust. Mm. Right. Sorry. Okay. Sorry, and nobody is accepting anti-Semitism because we are Semites too. Mm. All right? Good, I'm Just to straighten yeah, the record, good. please. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, sir. Um, the director of the Russian Center for Sociopolitical Studies uh, was recently quoted as saying, if the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict is not solved in 2013, war is inevitable. And he went on to say, if Russia joins the war on the part of Armenia, Turkey will take steps uh, on the part of Azerbaijan. I would like to hear your opinion on this topic. Well, then Turks are fools if they take positions. Because, you know, they're no match to the Russians. And everybody is having a wrong impression about Russia. That Russia, after the crumbling of the Soviet Union, never lost its military power, my friend. Russia is a strong power. It is there. It's building its economy. And it's making its comeback now. We have to be aware of the Russians and the Chinese. And this is the worrisome part for the United States 
that the Russians are coming back strongly into the Middle East region and basically into what, I mean, you know, as, 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 as a power in Central Asia and as, 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 as an economic power, it is coming back to the international scene. And I believe that regional and sectarian conflicts have been more explicit when the, when, the, when the Soviet Union crumbled, when we were with an international system with a unipolar power, and that is the United States. But when we had the balance of power in an international system, regardless we are pro or against communism, we had more stability and security. Now, I think the issue of security and stability is coming forward not only on the political level, but also on the economic level. Because now there are partners that would really share. And let me go one further, one step further. Do you think the Americans are interested in building democracy in Iraq and Afghanistan? Are we naive to believe that the Americans went inside Iraq, crumbled the Saddam Hussein, and they were the ones who prompted him to go to Kuwait Okay? And they went into Afghanistan after what they call, you know, the Taliban. And they have created Islamic fundamentalism after the crumbling of the Soviet Union in order for them as imperialist power to create an enemy in order to be involved. So we no more have communism, we have Islamic fundamentalism. You think we are naive enough not to understand that they want to control the Gaspian Sea, the pipelines for their own interests in the, in the Middle East area? We know that. This is part of the U.S. geostrategic interest. And the Russians are not stupid to accept that kind of influence and power on their borders. So in the final analysis, there is a confrontation. But that confrontation cannot really be solved through arms or through nuclear powers. Because the end result is destruction of the whole world. That's why they are resorting to power politics through negotiations. And I don't believe I don't believe regional powers would really pull great powers into great war. I don't believe that. It cannot be done. It's against the interests of all parties. But yes, in terms of support, arms, economic, confining it to regional strife, yes, that happens. And it has been happening for the last 20, 25 years. But I don't think major wars are going to be attacked because of Nagorno-Karabakh. If the Palestinian issue did not draw an international confrontation. I don't think Nagorno Karabakh stands a chance. Professor, yes, sir. Um, thank you very much uh, for your presentation. Uh, at the end of the, your lecture, you said that um, you talked about the self determination of people from Nagorno Karabakh. And, uh, but we cannot deny, however, the fact that there were also Azeris living in, in the territory. Uh, you also said that they are welcome to come back and live there, but we all know that this is actually not possible because uh, these two nations. Uh, I don't, at this point of time, they, they can't live together. Mm. Uh, so uh, what is your view on this? How would we respond to us? We have, we we have listen, listen, listen. We're, we're trying to compare here. I, as a Palestinian, when I talk about Jerusalem to be shared and to be an open city, and this is the arch enemy, my arch enemy who has been killing me for the last hundred years, I'm accepting him to live in conviviality in that, in that you know, city where I wouldn't, build walls between East and West Jerusalem. As the professor said, you know, Berlin walls have crumbled and now Israel is building Berlin walls. What we're saying is the fact that the question of political autonomy or political sovereignty, if it goes to the Armenians because they are the rightful owner and we can prove that in history and what have you, it does not negate the fact that Azeris cannot come and live. Let them live as citizens of Nagorno-Karabakh. What's wrong with that, my friend? There is nothing wrong with that. Well, it's not if they want also to share power in the future as, as part of being citizens, if you talk about building true democracy, right? Political participation should be open to all citizens regardless of their race, creed, and religion, and nationality. That's my approach, my friend. Now, how our government in Nagorno-Karabakh thinks that's something else. But we're trying to be conflict practitioner. We try to solve issues. We're trying to come up with some plausible ideas. I'm not denying the fact that I have to, to drive all the Jews into the sea because I want to liberate Palestine. Is that a plausible solution? Of course not.
Now, ahlan wa sahlan, we say in Arabic, if they want to come and live peacefully, fine. We're not kicking them out. They have lived there as a minority of their lives, but they were controlling it because of the sustaining of the status quo since 1917. It comes the time where the people of Nagorno-Karabakh said enough is enough. This is not your country. We've been the majority. It's our land, this, this, and we are under Azeri occupation. Then if the occupying power is being kicked out of Nagorno-Karabakh and through a war that is considered to be just as far as the Armenians are concerned, then our compromise is to give them back the 40 square kilometers. And then Nagorno-Karabakh is there. We can put the borders. If they want to come and live peacefully as citizens of Armenia, ahlan wa sahlan. First of all, thank you for this useful presentation and thank you for UCL Armenian uh, Student Society for this event. Just I would like to ask you, in your opinion, what are the legal obstacles to not implement this right of self-determination, both in nagorno karabakh and Palestine? It's not a matter of legal obstacles as much as it's, the, it's a matter of power politics, my friend. All these resolutions that came out in favor of Palestine have not been implemented. Show me one, 242, 338, I can't, 191, 194. Show me one single resolution that came out was implemented. Why? Because you need mechanisms of implementation. And mechanisms of implementation meaning force and power. And if the great powers are not putting their efforts and their political way in implementing these resolutions, nothing is going to happen on the ground. Mm -hmm. Now, I tell you, we have been accepted by 138 countries in the world as non-member status in the United Nations, right? But between you and me, if my president wants to cross from Ramallah to Jerusalem, which is only five miles, a 19-year-old kid, a female kid even, to add insult to injury, as far as the pride of the Arabs are concerned, <laughs> huh? cannot allow him to pass. Now, when we talk about independence, we talk about political sovereignty. And when we talk about political sovereignty, we talk about borders and control. If you don't have, then how do we claim independence? But it was a moral, <coughs> symbolic gesture. The Palestinians went there to show the world enough is enough, the West Bank, and Gaza are not contested territories. These are occupied territories, one. Number two, we went there to save the two-state solution because the other option is coming. One state solution, one man, one vote. And Israel, of course, doesn't accept that because we have our power of producing babies and they have nuclear powers. And our power is more efficient than their power because they cannot use nuclear power, but we can continue using our demographic power. <laughs> And the question here is the question of numbers. When it got, in the year 2020, we are the absolute majority there. So one man, one vote for them, meaning the total abortion of something called Jewish state. And that's why from now, they have been imposing upon us to accept them as a Jewish state. We say, why do you want our acceptance for a Jewish state? Why don't you go to the United Nations? Put a new, a new request that you're not the state of Israel, you are the Jewish Republic, and let the entire nation vote on it. Why do you want us? The reason why they want us to accept the question of Jewish state, first, to get rid of 1.6 million Palestinians who hold Israeli citizenship and living inside Israel proper, and second, to deny 7 million Palestinians the right of return as refugees. That's why they want the question, and that's why they were against us going to the United Nations. Sorry, Vaan, you take care. Yeah, very, very. Sad. New mother. We've actually ran out of time. They're waiting for the for the next event to take place. So perhaps, perhaps in another time. Inshallah. In the future. Event. Thank you. Thank you very much.